Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Listen, folks. He is an American advocate for health insurance payment reform. He is a former health insurance industry executive, a communications director. He is the New York Times bestselling author of Deadly Spin, an insurance company insider speaks out on how corporate PR is killing healthcare and deceiving Americans. He's a critic of HMOs and the tactics used by health insurers. Wendell Potter is one of our leading national advocates for major reforms of the insurance industry, including a supporter of Medicare for All and universal health care. He is that voice that we need to be listening to right now, especially in these times. Welcome to Politics Done Right, Senor Potter. Well, you said, Wendell, welcome to Politics Done Right. How are you doing today? Thank you. And please do call me Wendell. It's good to be on the show. Thank you so much. Well, look, let me let me tell you, um, it has gone from bad to worse. I remember during the Affordable Care Act, you had said, watch what's going to happen if we don't get the public option in the Medicare expansion. They will game it again. I I, I just want to start there before we get into the core of what we're going to talk about. Your thoughts. That's right. Uh, I testified before Congress a number of times when members of Congress were debating what became the Affordable Care Act. And I said that if they pass that bill without a very good public option, that they might as well call their bill the Health Insurance Industry Profit Protection and Enhancement Act. Uh, The House did pass a version of the bill that had a public option. The Senate did not. Uh, And so we we wound up without it. And uh, uh, I hate to say I told you so, but Since that time, big insurance companies have gotten so much bigger, so much more profitable. They're massively bigger than they were uh, when I uh, was in the industry and at that time, uh, to the point that uh, two of those big insurance companies are now uh, number five and number six in the Fortune 500 of the biggest American companies. Uh, Their profits are outsized and they are just able to do Pretty much what they want to do. They are controlling our healthcare system in ways that uh, I feared, and uh, we've simply got to do something about it. We really need to wake up to what's going on. Now, you were you were an an insider. You were a part of this whole entire uh, insurance industrial complex, if, if you will. What within your soul made you say, you know what? I'm going to leave these millions of dollars that I uh, that I my future worth would be and I'm going to do what's morally right. What got into you that uh, because I I want to uh, for the audience I want to say something that's important Wendell. The current people in the healthcare industry in the insurance industry they are doing their fiduciary responsibility, which is to maximize the profits for their shareholders, enhancing the executive bonuses. They're doing nothing illegal. They're doing what they're supposed to do. You are just a cog in the system. What Wendell has said is that's not how a healthcare system should be run. It shouldn't be run in that framework. Run with that, sir. Well, that's right. When I first started working in healthcare, I was working for a nonprofit hospital system in Tennessee, where I'm from. Uh, then I went from there to work for Humana uh, and then Cigna. So 20 years I spent inside uh, two of the biggest insurance companies in the country. And I at first was uh, unaware of the implications of for-profit companies or Wall Street controlling our healthcare system. But I became uh, more and more aware of the consequences. As I uh, rose up through the ranks at those companies, uh, I was able to see things that most people do not have a chance to see. I worked very closely with the CEO and the CFO, the investor relations team. I came to just see uh, and understand how Wall Street does control our healthcare system or controls those companies and any other country company that uh, is uh, an investor based or in, you know owned by investors. I had a crisis of conscience. In my first career, I was a newspaper reporter, and I tried to make sure that I was telling the truth and never obscuring anything that was important for people to know. 
But I came to realize that's exactly what I was doing in my role. I was vice president of corporate communications for Cigna. I worked uh, uh, you know, one of my, my my name was on every one of the company's earnings releases for 10 years. So I had to know how these companies made money, uh, what where it came from and what they did with it. And I came to realize that uh, the way they made their profits was, in many cases, making sure that people did not get the care that they needed. And the system that we had in place was one in which uh, increasingly Americans were not able to buy insurance. 50 million people didn't have insurance when I left the industry and when Congress began debating what became the Affordable Care Act. I came from a humble beginnings. I uh, grew up in uh, rural East Tennessee uh, in a working class family, farming family. Uh, and I know what poverty is like. I know what it is like when people do not have access to care. Uh, and I, uh, some things happened to me uh, a few months before I decided to leave my job that just made it abundantly clear to me that I was doing the wrong thing, that I was making, I, I was contributing to the problems in our healthcare system, and I decided I couldn't do that anymore. You know, you tell a story about uh, seeing people come down from the hills to uh, to uh, a health to, to get healthcare to get free healthcare and the, the impact it had on you on on you your psyche tell me a little bit about that yeah while i was still in my job i flew back to visit family in east tennessee and i read in the hometown newspaper about something that i'd never heard of before an organization called remote area medical was uh, hosting a big outdoor clinic or a clinic at a, a county fairground not too far from where i grew up I was curious because the article said people would be coming from hundreds of miles away, even as far away as Ohio and, and Florida, to get care that was being provided free by doctors and nurses and dentists who were volunteering their time over three days. This was in late July, and I went there, again, out of curiosity, and I saw something that just shook me to my core when I went into the fairground. Uh, people were lined up by the hundreds, waiting patiently to get care. It was raining that day, so these people were soaking wet, but they were not going to be leaving their lines uh, to because they had been, in many cases, sleeping in their cars for days uh, to get an opportunity to go inside the fairground to, to get the care that they needed. And I, I saw that some of those lines led to barns and animal stalls on that fairground site. Uh, this was a county fairground. Uh, and I just... Uh, uh, immediately realized that I had to take some responsibility for what I was seeing because my job was to help perpetuate the system that we had in place, the system that still is in place. And uh, I made a commitment that day that I would uh, have to find some other way to earn a living. I saw people there who could have been people I grew up with, could have been my neighbors, could have been high school friends, could have been relatives of mine. Uh, and I, uh, I, I tears stole down my uh, flow down my my face as I was looking at what I was seeing, and uh, I, uh, I I made a commitment uh, to to try to figure out what I could do about that. I didn't think I would be a whistleblower, uh, but I just uh, knew that I couldn't keep doing what I was doing, despite the fact that I was making quite a bit of money. You know, it's interesting because you're a whistleblower, a, a, a whistleblower, and you've blown the whistle and you blow the whistle over and over again. And it's amazing how the gravity of the system is so self-sustained. And one of the, the things that I that I promise to do in my life and with my platform and, and hopefully with with your help and the help of everybody else is to just let the average rank and file American understand what you saw there is not an anomaly, but it's something that's out there throughout this country, the richest country in the world, where we can't get the health care that we not that we deserve, but the health care that as a rich country we have all earned. We have all earned, irrespective of whether you are a McDonald's flipper or an executive in a, in a corporation. Now, um, it turns out that um, in the past, one of the reasons Medicare came into be is because private insurance couldn't quite find a way to profit from the healthcare on older people. So therefore, right. as usual, the things that are not that that the private sector cannot make a dollar on, they usually pass it on to the government. The government will take care of that. So mm -hmm. Medicare was passed on to the government. Now, following that, 
bribing politicians. These guys figure out a way we can take back Medicare in a more secure, in a more advantageous way for us. Why don't you explain to us that procedure that occurred that has led us now to Medicare Advantage, a big one of the largest frauds on on the American taxpayers? You know, you're exactly right. Uh, insurance companies had no interest in trying to insure older people, uh, people on fixed incomes, people who didn't have a lot of money. Uh, they, those people couldn't afford their premiums. Uh, so that you're right. That's why the Medicare program was created. Uh, but over the past several years now, uh, past 20 years in particular, uh, these companies have figured out because of their closeness to politicians, they were able to convince politicians uh, that let us take care of access to care for people who are enrolled in Medicare. We can do it more efficiently. We can make sure that people get the care that they need and cost taxpayers less money. That certainly was, uh, they, they sold policymakers a bill of goods. Uh, I, at the time, thought, well, maybe that is maybe that is uh, something that can be pulled off. So I was going along with it. Uh, but what we have seen is that uh, more and more taxpayer dollars are going straight into these big companies. And what they're doing uh, through their Medicare Advantage plans, Medicare Advantage, by the way, was created in 2003 uh, by uh, when Congress passed what was referred to or called the Medicare Modernization Act. Mm -hmm. It created not only the uh, version of private Medicare that we have now, but also the Part D prescription drug Mm -hmm. plan. And both of those programs have turned out to be extraordinarily big cash cows for big insurance companies. And they have been aggressively uh, marketing uh, these plans to the point that more than half of people who are eligible for Medicare in America these days are enrolled in one of these plans. And and they're extraordinarily profitable because these companies have been able to rig the system to get more and more money out of the federal government, out of uh, our tax dollars. And uh, one other way that they're able to make so so much money is by refusing to pay for care that people need. Uh, there's a, a practice called prior authorization that is used aggressively uh, by these companies uh, to make sure that people are not getting the care that their doctors know they need. So people are dying. People are dying prematurely because of these denials and delays of care in Medicare Advantage. Now, let me ask the question this way. How do you convince a politician that a government uh, who is administering Medicare Whose sole, whose sole expense is administering that bill, figuring out how to pay, figuring out if there's fraud here or there, compared to a private company that has to pay ex- high paid executives, that have to pay bonuses, that has to pay shareholder dividends, that has duplicative services, meaning if there are several insurance companies, each of them have their own database database administrators, uh, advertising budgets, all that sort of stuff. All of those are all costs coming out of that same pot that the government would have to spend out of if it didn't. In other words, all those costs are costs not going towards healthcare. It's going towards administering. Why would they fall for the private sector fallacy that's been told many a times that in every case, the private sector is more efficient than the public sector? Really three ways. Uh, One is obscuring that kind of information to hide that, to not talk about that. You don't ever lead with that kind of information. Uh, The other is uh, uh, through relationships and ideology. You are able to convince uh, politicians that you have helped uh, fund their campaigns uh, that are ideologically aligned with your point of view, who who have the opinion that the private sector can do anything better than the government more efficiently. Uh, and uh, a lot of politicians, a lot of people buy into that. They, We in this country have this notion that the capitalistic system uh, is sacred and uh, something that uh, can always do a better job of, of uh, whatever it might be than the federal government. So you have that. But the other thing is what I was alluding to, campaign contributions and lobbying. Uh, these companies are able to uh, shell out 
millions and millions of dollars every election uh, to campaigns. And they uh, send money to both Republicans and Democrats. And that's protection money. Uh, and they spend a lot of money on lobbyists. Every uh, big company has a lobbyist uh, on staff, but also spend enormous sums of money hiring uh, firms that do lobbying in Washington and the state capitals. So you have all of those things playing together. And that in, that has got us to where we are now. Uh, it's lying and obscuring information. It is uh, uh, lobbying and it is campaign contributions and just frankly, ideology. Uh, uh, so many people are blind to the fact that uh, these companies are ripping off taxpayers left and right. You know, um, before I, I came on with you, um, every the first Saturday of every month, I have a program, a, an addendum to my radio show called Ask Egberto Anything. And I told them today that I was speaking to you and, you know, uh, they were very happy to know, wow, you're speaking to Wendell. Ask him two specific questions. Since we're talking about Medicare Advantage, they said, what can we do to change the name Medicare Advantage to something more appropriate to let people know Medicare Advantage is neither an advantage nor is it Medicare? One thing is to support a bill that was introduced by two members of Congress, uh, Congressman uh, Mark Pocan of Wisconsin and Rokana of California. Uh, they are the lead sponsors of a bill that would uh, prohibit these companies from even using the name Medicare in their marketing materials. Uh, that is really important because people don't know the difference. Uh, and the advertising that they do uh, conflates the two programs. People don't know that Medicare Advantage is really a privately operated uh, big business. They don't really understand that. And the advertising purposely obscures that. Uh, so that's one thing. One is to support that legislation, to write letters, make phone calls to your members of Congress to support that. Uh, and also to support legislation that would uh, crack down on how they're marketing these plans. There's also, there are also bills before Congress that would do that. We're, I'm seeing that members of Congress are beginning to wake up, uh, certainly on the Democratic side, but even Republicans are beginning to understand how the program that they largely created uh, has been ripping off taxpayers, has been depleting the Medicare trust fund. Uh, so, But it requires people to reach out to their members of Congress and say, this is something that has to change. And the various ways we have to change it is, number one, like you are, were saying, keep these companies from even using the name Medicare in their, in their marketing materials. The next question, uh, and, and this I think is a difficult question. I don't even know where to start, but right now we spend more than twice what probably the most expensive country spends right now on their health care. Um, how can we, forgetting about insurance and all of that, how can we reduce the amount that's being spent on health care, given that our outcomes are no better than the other countries? Well, you really do have to have a fundamental rehaul of our healthcare system to do that. The big reason, the biggest reason is because of administrative costs in this country, uh, about a third of what we spend. And we now spend four and a half trillion dollars on healthcare altogether, uh, which is, you're, you're exactly right, is twice as much as the average of all the other developed countries in the world. Uh, and they provide, those other countries provide better care than we do, and they provide universal coverage, and we don't. Uh, and it's largely because, number one, the administrative cost, when you have all these insurance companies and for-profit entities involved in healthcare, every one of those uh, adds to administrative costs. When you have these private insurance companies operating, all of those companies have high administrative overhead, but they make it necessary for doctors and hospitals to also have administrators, people who do nothing more than work day in and day out with big insurance companies. Uh, so that's a big thing. And the other is to just curtail the power of these big companies, break them up. Uh, you've got, like I said, uh, United Healthcare is the fourth largest company in America. CVS, which owns Aetna, uh, is the uh, sixth largest. Cigna, where I used to work, is the 15th largest. They're far, far bigger than they were when the Affordable Care Act was passed. We've got to work with our members of Congress and the administration, with the FTC, to call for these companies to be broken up because we're getting to the point that you've got just a very, very few large corporations uh, run by Wall Street and investors uh, that uh, is really calling the shots. 
And they don't have any incentive in bringing down the cost of care because as the cost of hospital care goes up, as the cost of drugs go, go up, these big insurance companies just increase premiums. Uh, and that is costing our employers and all of us as employees and taxpayers uh, enormous sums of money that uh, that's simply unknown in other countries. Um, as as a as someone who understands that Medicare for all, healthcare for all, universal healthcare, whatever you want to call it, one word we are all uh, that we are all uh, have healthcare. It's a right that we all have healthcare. I understand that if there's a single payer handling that. I understand that if we take the for-profit method out of the delivery of the service, out of the uh, administer of service, that it would be more efficient. My question to you, given the infrastructure that we have in this unwieldy system, what would be the pathway, what would be the migration from this unwieldy system into a well-organized healthcare for all system? It's a good, good, very good question. And I think there are various ways of getting there. One is to try to get it done in Washington. That's a very, very heavy lift, as we've seen. Uh, there are organizations that have been trying to get that to happen for more than 30 years. Uh, uh, the other is through the states. Uh, and some states are uh, considering legislation, California in particular, uh, but also other states have uh, legislation that will be considered that would create a state-based single-payer system or some kind of a system that would be similar to other countries around the world, other developed countries that are doing this much better than we are. So that's that's one way. I think it is going to be very, very hard for us to see that kind of change in Washington until we do something about who is in Congress. Uh, you've got the makeup of Congress now uh, such that it's 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 not going to happen in the foreseeable future. So we've got to get involved in the political process. My second book was called Nation on the Take, How Big Money Corrupts Our Democracy and What We Can Do About It. And that is at the core of the problem that we have, is that these companies are, are being able to control the, the levers of power in Washington and the state capitals. We've really got to address that. And whenever I have a chance to talk to people who support single-payer health care, Medicare for all, whatever you want to call it, uh, or just to uh, progressively improve the system that we have, uh, you're running up against the power of these big corporations that spend so much money, uh, as, as we were talking earlier. So you've got to do something. I uh, ask uh, advocates, try to devote some, some time and attention to money in politics, because that is so important, so fundamental, and it's a big barrier to getting to where we need to be. Uh, Wendell, uh, my last question is always the same. What would you have liked me to ask you or what should I have asked you that I didn't? I don't know that I you've covered uh, fundamentally, I think, the biggest questions, the biggest reasons why uh, we are where we are and what we need to do. I think uh, that I would say that uh, to get to universal coverage, uh, let's not get hung up necessarily on one one path. Uh, we've got to consider how else can we get there? What other things can can happen? And I would say that employers have a big responsibility as well, too, because so many of us get our coverage through the workplace. I would encourage people to talk to their employers, to their HR people, uh, to protest the fact that every year our premiums go up, our out-of-pockets go up. So we've got to wake up and realize that our pockets are being picked day in and day out. I lead a coalition of organizations called Lower Out-of-Pockets Now. There's stuff that has to be done that's incremental before we get to single-payer health care uh, so that we're not spending so much money uh, and not being able to pick up our medications, not being able to go to the doctor because of the high out-of-pocket costs that we are subjected to. So there's a lot that we can do as advocates other than uh, just supporting Medicare for all or universal health care, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we've got problems right now. People are dying every single day because of the practices of these companies. So I would encourage people to pay attention to that and call on their lawmakers to do something about the things that can be fixed right away. Uh, rather than uh, looking down the road to achieving uh, a healthcare system that is more just, we've got there's some steps we can take right now to get us where we uh, closer to where we need to be. I'm glad you said that because that also helps me because there are certain times that I I just want to jump on it and get it done all right away. But you're absolutely right. There are things that we can do incrementally right now that eventually puts us on the path there. Uh, Wendell, you have a newsletter 
that is packed with information. And I tell you what, I, I am ashamed that I didn't quite read your newsletter before. I just read the material that you put out there in the in the ethos all of the times. I found that I sub, I became I just want you to know I became a paid subscriber of your newsletter today. Why don't you tell people how they can find your newsletter? My newsletter, thank you, Egberto. It's uh, uh, it's called Healthcare Uncovered or Wendell Potter's Healthcare Uncovered on the Substack platform. You can find it at wendellpotter.substack.com or just Google me and Healthcare Uncovered and you'll find it. The content is free. I do appreciate the paid subscriptions because that helps us to do more reporting. Uh, we have, I think, some of the best analysis and, and uh, uh, essays on healthcare that anybody's producing, things that other reporters are not covering. Uh, and uh, we have some other voices that contribute as well, too. So thank you very much. And I hope people will sign up. Again, it's free, but we certainly appreciate the paid subscriptions. It helps us a great deal. Wendell Potter, one of the leading national advocates for major healthcare reform in the country and the author of Deadly Spin, an insurance company insider speaks out on how corporate PR is killing healthcare and deceiving Americans, as well as the other book that he just mentioned that will also be in this blog. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. Thank you so much, Shapiro. Thank you. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.